Well, good morning, Walden Church. I hope that between last week and today, you're going to come away with the fact that the Bible is pretty important. <laughs> it is the story of God. It is the Word of God. And like we saw last week, it's been preserved and protected and defended for generations. But the bigger impact and influence and power of the Bible is so much more, uh, I believe, not, not when it's studied, but when it's lived out. And it, it becomes lived out through the people who read it. So yes, let's read it, let's know it, let's memorize it, let's pray through it, let's sing through it, and let's read it some more. <laughs> but let's make sure through all of it that we obey it and that its lit words are lived out in us. So we've looked at how to trust the Bible and today I wanna to look at how to read and live the Bible. Colossians 3 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I love verse 16 there. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. That image is that the Bible is in us, living in us, integrated into our lives. That means the Bible is like food, right? It should be inside of us because it nourishes us, it helps us grow, and just like food, if it's not in our life, then we should hunger for it. We should feel its absence in our life. So how do you read the Bible correctly? And how do you make it a part of your life? How does the message of Christ dwell in you richly? So today I wanted to look at this crazy book, because it is, it is a crazy book. It's like no other book on the planet. You can't compare the Bible to any other book, because somewhere along the line, you were handed this book, right? Either at confirmation or Sunday school or graduation, or you got it as a gift uh, for Christmas, and somebody said, here, read it. So we try to read it. We try to read it just like we try to read other books because we don't know any other way. Or we study it the way we studied other books in school because we don't know any other way. But the Bible can't be read like any other book. It can't be studied like any other book because it's not any other book. Not to mention that no matter where you go, you will always find disagreement about how it should be read or interpreted or taught or translated or studied. So where do you begin? How do we start? Well, I'll start with this. The Bible is not an instruction manual. It's not an instruction manual. Growing up, there was a popular bumper sticker that said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And what that says is, we believe everything the Bible says, so we practice whatever the Bible teaches. That's not true, <laughs> right? That's totally not true. Because nobody does everything the Bible teaches. If the Bible were actually an instruction manual, we would spend more time following the instructions, I think. For instance, the Bible says to practice a Sabbath. Let's just forget the part that the original Sabbath is Saturday, right? How many of us can honestly say that we observe a biblical day off from work and we dedicate it entirely to the Lord? Oh, and by the way, that's actually one of the Ten Commandments. 24 hours, no work, worship. We can't say the Bible is an instruction manual because we don't follow the instructions. Jesus says in John 13, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Those are Jesus' words, and that sounds like an instruction. But I have never washed anyone's feet. 
Have you? 2 Corinthians 13 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, every Sunday we encourage you to shake hands and say hi to one another. Maybe we should change the slide up there to say kissing time. Jesus says in Luke, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Again, those are Jesus' words, Jesus' instruction. How come these seemingly hard and fast rules about foot washing and kissing and giving up your possessions aren't followed, aren't practiced more closely by the church? Well, I mean, let's be extremely honest, okay? Let's be extremely honest. It's because we pick and choose what to follow and what not to follow. And listen, that is not to shame us, that is not to embarrass us, because we all do it. Billy Graham did it, Mother Teresa did it, Andy Stanley did it, your favorite TV preacher or Christian author does it. Yes, the Bible has stuff to say about marriage, premarital sex, homosexuality, drinking, but if the Bible tells me to wear a head covering or to give away all my possessions or to love my enemies, well, then what? Exodus 22 says, do not allow a sorceress to live. Tell me something. Do you spend your free time hunting down and killing witches? And this is only a handful of verses. And there are hundreds of verses like this. We like to say the Bible is black and white, but it clearly isn't if we don't follow all the instructions. And so before we go forward in how we should read it and study it, we all have to agree that none of us follow this to the letter. We all approach the scriptures with a filter or a, a lens that we interpret the words through. It's equally important to talk about the filter and how best to live with it. So if the Bible is not an instruction manual, what is it? The Bible is a story. The Bible is a story. Of course the Bible is a story. And it might be silly to repeat that again, but it needs to be repeated because it is the foundation of how we approach the text. The Bible is a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning is the Genesis 1 through 11. The middle is Genesis 12 to Malachi 4 to Matthew to parts of Revelation. And the end is Matthew 25 and Revelation 21 and 22. Another way of looking at this could be plot, right? We have oneness with God, brokenness with God, the first attempt to reconcile that broken relationship, and then we have oneness with God through Christ, and then we will be perfectly united with God. Every author of the Bible is writing along one of those plot lines. Their story is inserted into one of those storylines, and they are recording history during one of those periods in time. So when you read Ezra or Malachi or Mark or Acts or Hebrews, you are jumping into a certain point in that story. So that means when you read the Bible, you know where you are in the story. That's crucial. And so when we talk about the unity of the Bible, the cohesiveness holds all the story together. And so naturally, context is everything. Context is everything. If I showed you the last two minutes of Casablanca, you wouldn't know what was going on. If I showed you the deliberation scene and Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you wouldn't care what the outcome was. If you see Darth Vader shake his fist at Luke and say, I am your father, it doesn't mean anything to you if there's no context to the scene. The Bible is no different. Let me give you an example. In Matthew 4, it says, He said, throw yourself to the ground for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. It sounds nice, right? Who's talking though? Who is the speaker in that? And then who are they talking to? And does this passage relate to me? Well, who is speaking? For better yet, is this a scripture that we should follow? I mean, it is scripture, right? So it's true. But how does this piece of scripture fit into the larger narrative? How does it fit into the story? Because who's talking in this? The devil, right? The devil's talking. And who is he talking to? 
Jesus. So is this meant for you and me? Is this a verse that we should follow? Is this our life verse? No. What is it? It's a conversation between Jesus and the devil. Those are all good questions to ask when you are reading something in context. Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? Does this relate to me? If the Bible is a story, then we should read it in context, and then we will have a better chance of not misinterpreting it. Let me give you another example. This is from Leviticus. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and stranger, so they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them food at profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. What does this verse say? It says, if your neighbor is broke, be kind. Don't sell them food at profit. Don't charge any interest on loans. It's in the Bible. Is that an instruction that we follow? No. Why not? Well, you're probably thinking the same exact thing I'm thinking, so I'll just say it out loud for both of us, okay? That was then, and this is now. And you know what? You are right. You are right. One of the filters that we use when we read scripture is something that when reading something in context, you can filter through and say, that was then, this is now. And that's the reason why retailers still charge interest, no matter how poor someone is. It's the reason we can wear fabrics with multiple fibers. It's the reason our women can wear jewelry and not wear head coverings in church, or they don't have to shave their head and cut all their fingernails the day after they get married. That's a Hebrew tradition. And it's the reason we don't leave church on Sunday to go kill witches. Times have changed. And the Bible even admits that. Hebrews 1 says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. The Bible reminds us in the book of Hebrews that God used to communicate to us differently in the past than he does in the present. God remains the same, the message remains the same, his words remain the same, but his methods of communicating change. This book, the Bible that we're talking about, is only one means that God uses to speak to us. He also talks to us through the Holy Spirit, through other believers, and through prayer. The beautiful wife of George Burns, Gracie Allen, once said, never place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. And another thing that should be really obvious to us, but that we probably have to say, alongside the fact that the Bible is a story, is that the Bible is comprised of language, right? And language has to be understood in context. Hebrew says God chose to speak to us through many writers, and he chose to speak to us in a variety of ways. So think about it. The story of the Bible is comprised of law, blessing, promises, political science, world history, anthropology, psychology, poetry, metaphysics, astronomy, epistemology, correspondence, and apocalyptic writing. Not to mention the fact that we also have four accounts of Jesus' life, right? We have four Gospels. Why? Why do we have four? Why not just one? Well, because the story of Jesus is so much greater and so much more beautiful than just one voice. And since the completion of Scripture, now we live in a world where we have the blessing of having different translations of the Bible. We benefit from men and women who help us translate the Scripture into language we can read. And so Hebrews says we have a God who reveals himself at many times in various ways. And one of those ways is in your hands. It's the Bible 
that God has placed in your hands. And it is his story. It is his story about how he interacted with us, how he taught us, how he loved us, how he died for us. So how should we read it? The Bible is a story. We should read it in context. It's comprised of language. If this Bible is a story, how do we read the story? Jesus says in Matthew, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The Bible is a story and what does Jesus say? Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine, we need to listen to the story. We need to listen. The Bible is God's story. We need to remember what it is, right? But the, at the same time, realize that God has existed long before the story ever did. God existed before the Bible. And every Bible <clears throat> could one day possibly be burned and thrown away. Every Bible could be destroyed and forgotten. And even if that happened, God would still exist. God is alive, and so that means his word is alive. So yes, it is a story, but it's more than a book. We read books, we study books, and sometimes we begin to treat the Bible the way we treat any other textbook, but it's not a book like any other. No other book is God's story, and because God uses a book to reveal himself, then we need to listen. We need to listen. Yes, several authors wrote these words. Yes, it happened over generations. Yes, the Bible is comprised of many themes. But the unifying element is that God is telling his story with his voice. So it's our responsibility to listen to the voice. Maybe you read, I don't know, Weathering Heights in school. Or you, you read uh, Eat, Pray, Love at book club. Those are books, right? But the Bible is a story that invites us into a relationship with God. And so that means we have to approach this book as a relationship, not an instruction manual that has rules to follow, but as an invitation to love and to better know our creator. Earlier I said, you need to read this in context, right? Well, the reason is because we run the danger of taking scripture out of context and then we twist the story. How many of us have uh, ever read a love letter, right? When you read it, did you think that letter was as worthless as the paper it was written on? No. Was it just squiggles and lines and dots? No. Words are personal exchanges. There are offerings of that person. And a love letter, those words, they come from the depths of someone's spirit. Those words, they're, they're more than ink, right? They are an extension of the person who writes them. Words like, I love you. I will always be there for you. I will always be with you. I will never leave you. Those are personal exchanges. Those words matter because the words represent a real relationship. And so how we respond to those words, that matters. In a very real example, my wife, Joanna, she will tell me that she wishes that I would listen to her better. And probably in my own defense, I always think that at the time I am listening. But the evidence of my listening comes through in my actions. Did I remember that we had dinner plans? Did I remember that the trash goes out on Thursday morning? And so the relationship then gets brought into question. How well do I love my wife if I don't listen and pay attention to her? Fellas, I'm, I'm asking you, <laughs> I'm talking to you right now. Obviously, she knows I do love her, but how much more assured of that is she when I show that I listen to her? The words listen and hear are mentioned in the Bible a lot, like 1,500 times. And the biggest complaint from God that we see in the Bible is that his people don't listen. 
Even the most important verse in all of Christianity and all of Judaism is Deuteronomy 6, and it begins with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. If we are his church, if we are his people, then we need to listen. Deuteronomy 17 says, The king must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. David's son, King Solomon, had over a thousand wives. Like 700 wives, 300 concubines. What do you think? What do you think? Tell me. Was King Solomon a good listener to the story of Scripture? No. Yeah, but, well, the, the early Mormon church said that Solomon had multiple wives, so clearly we can too. And it wasn't until 1890 that their church said, no, that's not being a good listener to the story. No, we're not paying attention to how God wants us to live. But some Mormons in Missouri still practice polygamy, even though it's illegal in all 50 states. Good Bible study is an act of love for God, and it's an act of listening to God. So when you approach the scriptures, you study the Bible, you should be doing more than just acquiring knowledge and information. We should be listening to the heart of God because it's about his love and our relationship with him. The Bible is a story. We need to listen to the story and we need to study the story. We need to study the story. Someone once said that reading the Bible without studying it is like trying to eat without swallowing. So last, I want to address how we study and perhaps go back to that filter and that bias that we use when we study. Jesus says in Matthew 7, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. What's that? What does that mean? Puts them into practice. It means obeys them, right? It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Question, do we follow and obey every line in the Bible? No. Why not? Well, because it'd be impossible. It'd be impossible to obey every command of Scripture. A.J. Jacobs, he was an agnostic. He wrote a book called The Year of Living Biblically, and he took it upon himself to obey every rule. And it took him four months to find every command in the Bible. And he made a book. It was 72 pages long. And he wrote down 700 laws, 700 instructions that he had to follow. 700 instructions in the Bible. And so the year of living biblically was a chronicle of how living out those commands made him view the world and made him view scripture. And if you're wondering, no, he did not kill a witch either. <laughs> A.J. Jacob said the rules that he broke every single day were do not covet, to always stand in the presence of the elderly, to not lie, to, to not utter the names of other gods, and to be slow to anger. The rules he never broke were, you shall not marry your wife's sister, you shall not plant your field with two kinds of seed, do not become a shrine prostitute, and you should not eat eagles, vultures, black vultures, kites, owls, or bats. <laughs> Could you obey 72 pages of rules every day? No, it's impossible. It's a monster task. Nobody is that diligent. Some theologians argue that even the Jews back then didn't live like that. They didn't live to that extreme. So that forces us to apply study and discernment. In our Christian tradition, we call this hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the interpretation. It's how we make the distinctions between that was then and this is now. We read the story, we listen to the story, and we discern the story. We read the Bible, we come across a passage like this that we just read, how do, and we ask ourselves, how does this fit into the story of God? And how do the answers help us live in a relationship with God in 2023? That's why, to me, Hebrews 4.12 calls the scripture the active word of God. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divining soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
the author of Hebrews says that Scripture is, again, more than just words on paper. It's alive, it's breathing, it's moving. That Scripture is actually leaving the printed page. It dives into your soul and it causes so much growth and thought that it'll even cause divisions in you about what you previously thought was right, what you've always thought was best. You grow. Discernment is growth. And Bible study is part of God's story, and we are called to live in it. It is our time to live these words. It is our time to obey these words. And of the three, I think this one is the hardest. Right? It is. It is the hardest. Reading the Bible as a story, that can be easy. Listening can be easy. But discernment is hard. And it can be messy. Plus, two of us might even disagree on how it should be interpreted, right? We, of course, we can all agree on, on simple scriptures like spousal abuse or stealing or selling your children into slavery. All of those seem pretty clear. But many things become hard and unclear for us. Why does a loving God send people to hell? That's a very popular question. Let me give you a real example in discernment. When I was being interviewed here for the church, I was asked a question about divorce. Not what the Bible said, but how do I interpret, right? What do I think? Mark 10 says some Pharisees came and tested Jesus by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Why would you ask Jesus this question in the first place? The Bible is pretty clear, right? It's black and white. Mm, no, it's not. <laughs> and so this is one of the popular discussions of Jesus' day. And different rabbis had a different hermeneutic. They had a different interpretation. They had different opinions. Listen to what Jesus says. He said, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Jesus' answer is in agreement with Genesis chapter 1. When two people get married, they become one. That is the biblical definition of marriage. Two become one in all regards, in every aspect of life. And it is God's desire that the two remain one, just as God wishes to remain one with us. That's the model. But in Matthew 5, Jesus makes a discernment. And he says, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexually immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now we have a little more clarity. Jesus says divorce is wrong unless there is a case of immorality. So we have a little more information. But then we jump to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. And Paul says, but if the unbeliever leaves, meaning divorce, let it be. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstance. And if you read the whole chapter, if you read that whole chapter, it's true that Paul agrees with Jesus, but he takes those words and he makes his own discernment. And, and, and that is that the rules of divorce aren't always hard and fast rules. And I think today the church still remains firmly committed to marriage while at the same time permitting divorce in cases where the marriage covenant has been broken. Now, does that mean the marriage covenant can only be broken by immorality? No, because today we understand that being faithful, being unfaithful, can take a lot of different shapes. We also know that if two people are no longer in love, it can be very unhealthy for everyone. I think we have all witnessed through the years, even in our own lives, the different ways a marriage covenant can break. And if you've been through divorce, then you know it's not black and white. If you watched your parents go through divorce, you know it's not simple. And so in these circumstances, we return to scripture. We take our tears to God, we wrestle with the words, and we discern 
how best to live and how best to move forward. So I think when the Bible says to not charge interest, the story of Scripture is not to oppress the poor. When Christ says to wash one another's feet, I think the story of Scripture is to have a servant's heart. When Jesus says to give up everything, the story of Scripture says that we should put God first in all aspects of our lives and not to allow the material things to ever get in the way of the spiritual. Bible study is how do we take the story of God and discern how we should live it today. And as new questions are presented and new situations arise, we will always be making new discernments because the words of God are alive. Does that mean that churches and Christians will always agree on everything that's in the Bible? No. But that's just the way it is. We'll do the best we can. So where does that that leave us? I own something like uh, 26 Bibles. I counted the other day, 26. Um, I'm a Bible junkie, and at one time or another, there's usually a Bible somewhere on my wish list. But look, none of them do me any good if I don't read them. And this is my takeaway for you. I want you to think about your Bible, the one you have, the one you read. Do you like reading it? When you read it, do you understand it? Because I would argue that if the answer is no to either of those questions, you should go get a different one. You should go get a new one. I'm serious. What did we just get through saying? This is the story of God, and it's unlike any other book. And if you own a book that has a difficult translation, doesn't have any helpful notes, it's missing pages, or in any other way it doesn't excite you, then get a new one. What would you consider when buying a Bible? Well, you would consider translation, right? First, you would consider translation. The spectrum of translation, here I'll throw up a slide for you, is based on what? What else? Discernment, right? That is a range of discernment. The range is word for word or thought for thought, and it all depends on what you are looking for. Word for word means the best possible word in English is chosen to replace the one that's in Hebrew or Greek. And it gives you the best picture the most precise, most literal meaning of the word. Thought for thought, those translations take a great uh, care to communicate in English the point of the verse, the meaning of the text using contemporary English. This makes the translation a lot easier to understand, a lot easier to read. And typically, my advice is you should have one of both. You read them side by side to get the best possible understanding. And if you look at that chart, which translation is just about right in the middle? The NIV, right? Which is why it is the number one seller. My advice is you go to the Bible bookstore and you open up translations to the same exact verse and you read them in that, in their own translation, or you can go to a website, biblegateway.com, Go to BibleGateway.com, look up the same paragraph and read them all, and then you can decide which one sounds like a Bible you would enjoy reading. The Bible in our pews at church is the ESV. Notice when you look at the chart, it's heavily in the section for being word for word, which means it's great for Bible study, but it could be difficult in casual reading. I always get asked as a pastor, which translation is the best? My answer is the translation that is the best is the one you read, the one that you're excited about reading. Having the best, most expensive, leather-bound Bible doesn't help you at all if you never open it. Besides translation, I like notes. I like notes. The reason I like good notes is the reason we talked about earlier, discernment, right? Much of the discernment of our day has been discussed, it's been argued, by people who are much smarter than you and me. And so while I'm reading, I would like their input. Of course, I believe we can read and discern the Bible on our own, but I think it's much better to do in community. 
And notes help you do that. Notes help you study in a community. And last, you would look at the focus. I think every Bible has a focus, and you should know what that is. It could be a chronological Bible, then you could put all the books in order for you. There's uh, an archaeological Bible that talks about all the things in history, or an apologetics Bible that tells you how best to communicate the gospel, or uh, a language Bible that helps you with all the Greek and Hebrew. Uh, Read it in contemporary English, like the Message, or the Voice, or the Story, or the New Jerusalem Bible. Every single Bible has a focus. There's nothing wrong with getting a new Bible. Don't think that your old Bible is going to be sad or that you're betraying it. (laughs) You can go get a new Bible if it's going to help you in your relationship with God. And today, thanks to technology, you can read the Bible on your phone, right? It's amazing how quickly we can download an app that has the whole Bible on it or listen to the Bible that's been recorded for us uh, on, a, on an app or a recording. The internet has lots of options about having someone read the Bible to you. You can listen to people read the Bible. YouTube, Spotify, you can even buy CDs. You can listen to Johnny Cash read you the Bible. There's all kinds of apps, verses of the day, emails that you can download. Or, or if you're the busiest person in the world, you can go get one of those Bible daily devotionals and just put it in the glove box of your truck. One of my favorite quotes is from John Wesley. And he said, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. And God himself has condescended to teach me the way. And he has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God and let me be a man of one book. When it comes to Bible study, don't just throw your hands up in the air and say, ah, I give up. This is too hard. Or this doesn't work for me. You live in 2023. There has to be something out there that you can do that'll get you into these words, get you into these pages, and bring you closer to God. And I pray that you discover that the story of the Bible is anything but boring and anything but ordinary. Let's pray. Lord, once again this week, we are reminded how precious your word is and how blessed we are to have it. As John Wesley says, may we be people of this word, people of this one book. Though we read your story, we listen to these pages, we obey your instruction, and we discern how best to live each year. We focus on this story and communicating this story to others that they would know it too. Help us to once again be excited about this story and excited about sharing your story with others. Give your church a hunger and a thirst for your word. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and watching today and being with us. Of course, we'd invite you to come and be here physically. We have church services every Sunday. We have two services, uh, one at 930. We have a choir. We're going to sing songs out of the hymnal. Uh, We have responsive readings. We sing the uh, doxology. We have the Lord's Prayer. We have communion. It's going to be exactly like church that you remembered when you were growing up. And then we have our 11 o'clock service, which is our contemporary service. We have a worship team. We're going to sing contemporary songs. Come casual. Come as you are. We also got a program for your children and your youth during that hour. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.